Okay, in this video, we're gonna talk about what a statement of work is. This is also known as an SOW. So let's get into it. So a statement of work is going to be a document that you craft with your client to outline what is going to happen inside of your freelancing or consulting engagement. Now, the statement of work is going to include various different things and I've seen multiple different types. Sometimes the statement of work will also include all the contract details with the payment terms and so forth. And then other times I've seen the statement of work included as an appendix to the contract and the statement of work will just contain, this is the scope of work that needs to happen. So let's talk about that first. Usually a statement of work is just going to be the scope of work that's going to be created. If you're going to be brought on site to help implement some type of continuous integration platform or DevOps platform for perhaps mobile applications, well, that would then outline it inside the statement of work. You're going to install these servers, you're going to configure them, you're going to install the continuous integration software, you're going to set up the automations, the pipelines, and all of that would be laid out in as much detail as possible in the statement of work. It perhaps would also then include how long each one of these things might take perhaps with an estimate. Again, I usually recommend there's some type of range included simply because you might not know what you don't know yet. And very often with clients, they're not giving you all the details until you get started. In that statement of work, you'll also usually include perhaps your hourly rate if that's not already included in your contract. Another thing that's also included inside of the statement of work is going to be the concept that's known as staff augmentation. Now there might be a bunch of work in there that's very specialized for what you're going to do, but it might also have a clause in there that says you're going to be doing some type of staff augmentation. And that means that you're typically just going to be a team member on the team for a particular time to help them through various different development platforms in the software industry. This usually happens, and I've encountered this multiple times, if the client wants to bring me on and help them train their team on the proper patterns and practices and development and design guidelines for different types of software. Perhaps they're trying to set up how to work in an agile environment while also working remotely. I've been brought in to help train teams on that. Maybe they're trying to figure out how to re-architect an application and they need someone to act as a lead during that time and they just want you there to help build future work until the team kind of gets their feet under them and they can do it on their own. And so this will be listed as some type of staff augmentation in your statement of work. The other type of statement of work is going to be something where you have the statement of work mixed inside of there with your contract. So again, your contract's gonna have the payment terms, the rates in which you're going to charge, where any type of litigation is going to happen. If for some reason there is going to be some type of legal disagreement, there's going to be all of the legalese documentation. It's inside of a typical contract as well as the statement of work. Anytime I start a contract, I make sure that I have some type of statement of work that's listed. So what are the couple of things that you do need when you're starting a new contract? Well, again, you need your contract and you need your start statement of work because you need to agree on what the work is that you're going to be doing. Now I have seen statements of work that are basically very generalized. Build this system and the end result is this. Now the client may not know exactly what and how they're going to get there. That can be very true of the case, especially if they've already adopted an agile type mindset. They know that we need to get to this location over here. We have six months to do it. So that might be the actual statement of work. Build system XYZ that's going to have these 12 features in it and it's going to be due in six months. It might be a half page statement of work. And inside of that statement of work, I'd also make sure that's stated in there that it will be done in an agile methodology with weekly sprints and weekly deliverables with demos done every other week or whatever the agile methodology is that the client is following. Therefore, you understand what has to be done. The client understands that you know what has to be done and you're on the same page. And then at that point forward, you can move on. Now, there's a caveat to this, and that is going to be fixed bid projects. When you have a fixed bid project, you're basically saying, I'm going to do some work for this dollar amount, and here's going to be the deliverable. The statement of work is going to dictate what that work is you're going to do. Now, 99% of the time, the client is going to change what they want, or they're going to add something to it. What you have to do at that point is then introduce some type of change order. It's going to be a modification to the statement of work. It's usually added on to this as another document. Every time the client requests a change, you should modify your statement of work. Now, if it's one small one-off thing, hey, can you change this button color to blue? Or can you make that button round instead of square? Maybe you decide to do that. However, this is a very slippery slope. As soon as you start changing a lot of stuff that's not inside of your statement of work, eventually, just because of human psychology, the customer and client gets used to you making these changes without having to do any type of change requirements. So you might wanna put some type of declaration inside of your statement of work saying, look, this accounts 
offer a 5% variance in time, up to 10 hours of change work is included inside of this fixed bid project. And as soon as you go over that 10 hours of changes that they have, then you have to start introducing change orders. And those new change orders on a fixed bid project are basically tiny fixed bid projects. They say, hey, you want to add these five new features to your app? Okay, we think it's gonna take an extra five days. So we need to get that approved by the client and it's going to cost us much more money. Therefore, what this does is protect you as a developer to make sure that you're getting paid for your time. And it also makes sure that the client is on board so they're not taking advantage of the developer on hand. This is important because as developers, we want to make sure that we're helping the client as much as possible. And we don't want to say no, it's very hard for developers to say, I don't want to do that. I don't feel, you know, I don't feel comfortable doing that. Or, Hey, I need to charge more money for this. There's just some inherent block that a lot of developers have. It's, a, it's just, they're not comfortable doing it. So if you can set this standard when you first start your contract and adhere to it as much as possible, you're going to make yourself in your life a lot easier simply because when that 10 hours is hit, it's in the contract and you need to communicate that to the client. Hey, I've hit that 10 hours of change requests. I see these got these new four or five change requests in. We need to go through a change order for this one. I'll draw that up and send it over to you with an estimate. And then that's what you do right there. That's now your job. You write that change order, which is basically saying, hey, here's the new features. Here's how long I think it's going to take. And then you work again, like you did with your original contract to get that approved. And if that's approved, you implement that. Now, what the client will then see is, oh, they're spending more money than I thought. It helps them keep them on budget and helps keep them true to what they're going to be building and helps keep you making sure that you're getting paid for the work that you actually do. So statement of work, very important in freelancing and consulting, just like a contract, make sure that you have one. Usually it's bolted on as some type of appendix. Usually appendix A is the statement of work in a lot of the contracts that I work with. And if you need any type of examples, feel free to drop a comment below and perhaps I'll post a sample contract and statement of work online where people can reference what some examples might look like. I hope that helps and I'll catch you in the next video.